Association of the Public Library putting on these sessions for us. I've seen some excellent ones last year, and uh, I know that there, there's more to come. There was, there was a really interesting one that looked like last night. And um, it, in this time when we can't get together in a normal way, these, these are a real delight to have uh, at our disposal. I'm also honored to be talking here in the early days of Black History Month, and it's a uh, it's exciting to be able to talk about this moment in the history of our cemeteries in our city, uh, given those connections as well. Let me start off by saying a little bit about who I am for those who may not have uh, met me or, or heard about me before. I did not grow up in Virginia, if that matters. It seems to matter to a lot of Virginians. Uh, I grew up in North Florida and was very interested in history as, as a kid and uh, moved to Richmond in 1999. So I've been here a little over 20 years and started off work at the Library of Virginia. And then in 2004, I uh, got a new job at Virginia Commonwealth University in the Department of History. So I've been a faculty member at VCU since 2004. Uh, my specialty is in architectural history and the landscape and as as Alex had actually said, uh, on, on religious elements of that landscape too. And so some of that relates to cemeteries. Uh, they, they have a religious component and they are architectural or at least a landscape feature. But when I started this project, which I'll, I'll show you the, the book cover and get into the book's contents in just a minute. But when I mentioned I'd been working on cemeteries, a lot of times I get strange expressions and people wonder, how did you get interested in that? How did you get interested in cemeteries? And that question strikes me as the, the, what's behind that seems to be an assumption that cemeteries are, are weird places or maybe creepy places or sad places uh, only used for funerals. And I think those who spend a little bit more time in funerals, uh, excuse me, in cemeteries understand that they, they actually have a lot to offer. They're very lively spaces as I hope to show you all tonight. Um, we, we can see that they change a lot over time. They're places of important boundaries between perhaps the living and the dead or between different groups. And they provide spaces that really show us who we are, who we think we are. And so I, I do find cemeteries really fascinating. Um, and I think that they give us a lens to view our, our history, either a city of a community or a city or a nation as a whole. Specifically, I got interested in this project about 10 years ago when a colleague at the University of Richmond, Doug Winiarski, suggested that we teach a class on the history of Richmond cemeteries. And it seemed like a fun idea or an interesting idea, a challenging idea. And so we worked together on that and ended up taking students around to a variety of different sites representing all kinds of different uh, eras and populations. And what we found in that class really got me excited uh, because it seemed to me that the landscape was changing around us as we started these tours in 2010, 2011. The burial landscape was really shifting from what we saw. And what I saw other scholars or other historians researching uh, wasn't as satisfying as I had hoped it to be. There's been great research done on some of these cemeteries, mostly on Hollywood Cemetery. Uh, but those tended to focus on, say, just Hollywood, just a single site, and not try to make as many direct connections with other sites, either before or after, or different social groups. Or maybe there were studies of African American cemeteries, but they had a lot less to say about how those might have related to other cemeteries, or Christian and Jewish, or Union and Confederate. So I wanted to try to put all of these different burial sites on the same page and see what we could learn about each one through those types of relationships or through that, to, uh, uh, through that frame. I also found that a lot of these cemeteries hadn't had a lot of research done on them. So the students were really key in helping me dig into some of the primary research to help chart the, the origins and development of these sites. And so what did we find? What story did we end up telling or the, the, did the book shape out as? Uh, one thing I would start off with is I think if we look over time, Cemeteries in Richmond have changed a lot from the beginning up until the present in terms of the, their, their form, their design, the kind of practices that took place there. But in the midst of all of those different stages of change, one thing in Richmond and Virginia generally that has stayed fairly constant was uh, what W.E.D.B. Du Bois called uh, the color line. 
uh, this issue of racism and racial separation, racial division. Um, white leaders consistently throughout these changes diminished or attempted to diminish, that is, the, the humanity of uh, non-whites and indigenous and black residents had to continually fight to maintain the dignity of their burials throughout these episodes of change. Um, the last part of my argument of the book suggests that we may find ourselves in a different moment now. It could be that in the past 20 years or so, certainly accelerating into the present in this kind of summer and year we saw last year, that the landscape, the historic landscape should, could be shifting towards a new type of community. And that's where the rebirth of the title, uh, Death and Rebirth in a Southern City comes in. So the book is structured through uh, several chapters, about eight chapters that start from the earliest burial grounds and follow their way up through all those changes and, and show the consistency of those uh, race relations, but also perhaps some of the openings that we see around us today. Why Richmond? Of course, it's easier for a faculty member at VCU to look around here at our local landscape and do the research that's in our, in our backyards. But I try to make the case in the book that this is an important study for the nation as a whole, for readers far outside of Richmond. Um, as we've seen last year, the entire nation, world, is invested in the type of memorials that uh, are represented here in Richmond, the one-time capital uh, of the Confederacy. Uh, Richmond sat here at the heart of the largest British colony, the largest early state in the Union, the capital of that state. Uh, it had a critical role in the Civil War, as we well know. Um, it was the center of the lost cause, the center of the fight uh, against segregation uh, during the period of massive resistance, uh, and on and on. And so we have a very symbolically important landscape here in terms of the burial grounds. And so I tried to focus on some really big significant sites that had a lot to say to not just our, our local scenario and to local families, but also um, to, to our national history. And by looking at just one community like Richmond over time, we can trace these long patterns. We can look at, as we know, Richmond has a very old history. So over the centuries, we can see how these patterns shift and change around. And also, as we know, uh, partially because of the slave trade and partially because of other migration patterns, there's a lot of families across the country. We've got some on the, on the call here tonight, on the Zoom tonight, who can trace, who are outside of Richmond, outside of Virginia, who can trace their ancestry back to this area. And so a lot of people outside of Richmond and Virginia care about the condition of these grounds. Well, uh, that's my preliminary talk. Hopefully we're stimulating some questions already. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here, Alex, and start some slides to share with everybody. I can see Alex, can you just nod? Do you see my slide up on the screen there, Alex? Okay, great. Um, there's the cover of the book, Death and Rebirth in a Southern City, Richmond's Historic Cemeteries. Um, I'm gonna begin with a map that appears at the very beginning of the book, which gives you in a nutshell, in a snapshot here, the kind of ground that the book tends to cover. I'll have to confess that I don't do as much in the book with the South Side. I know that the South Side, south of the James River, has a really interesting history of its, of its own. Maury Cemetery, Mount Olivet Cemetery figure in the book a little bit, but most of my attention is focused on uh, the settlements north of the James River. And if you look at the numbers that correspond with the, the, the legend here of the titles and the dates that they're founded, you can see a pattern of about three different stages of cemetery development. The earliest ones took place in the historic core of the city down just east of Shaco Creek and what we now call Church Hill or in the Shaco Valley. Um, the next grouping of cemetery sites moved to the north side of the city around what would become Barton Heights, just on the edge of Jackson Ward and that boundary with Henrico County. And then the third phase beyond all that or stage beyond all of that took place to the west and to the east of the city with the founding of Hollywood Cemetery, Oakwood Cemetery, uh, Richmond National Cemetery, Evergreen and East End, as well as Riverview and Mount Calvary. So here for those maybe a little bit less with for Richmond's topography and, and uh, geography, this, this will be a very quick pinpoint to some of the locations we'll be talking about tonight. 
And I think it's best to start uh, with indigenous remains. You know, we recognize that we are on Powhatan land here in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, the stone that you see there in the right has this plaque on it declaring that it is the Powhatan stone. It's mounted today in Chimborazo Park on the east end of the city overlooking the river where you can see it today. I suggested to you this might be the only public commemoration of Native American burials within Richmond. Um, certainly there are those of indigenous descent buried individually in cemeteries throughout town. Uh, there are a larger number of indigenous burials among the Pamunkey or the Mattapani or the Chickahominy on those lands outside of Richmond to the east of us on, on some reservations there. Um, but within Richmond proper, this stone here uh, was previously interpreted, as you can see on the left, on the Mayo estate, just east of town, uh, as Powhatan's grave, Powhatan's grave marker. And that's Powhatan, the chief of the Powhatan chiefdom, uh, the leader who greeted the English when they founded Jamestown in the early 17th century. Uh, the Pamunkey tribe and on its reservation through oral tradition does claim the actual resting place for Powhatan, but early guidebooks to the city uh, made a big deal of thinking that this could be the Chief Powhatan's burial site. And so in 1924, as the Mayo Estate was being developed, um, the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities took this stone that was interpreted as Powhatan's grave marker and moved it in 1924 to Chimborazo Park. There's uh, some rebirth here, if we want to think about the treatment of these remains or the possibility of these remains in the present day. To get there, we have to look on the left and acknowledge that uh, for many years, collectors looted Indian graves in the area and archeologists stored indigenous remains in study collections uh, in various repositories. Uh, at the Valentine Museum held a large collection of Indian remains for most of the 20th century. Um, you can see the skeletons at museum are bone of contention where they are treated basically as curiosities and occasionally put on display. Uh, on the right, you see a photograph I took at a VCU warehouse in 2015, um, where remains uh, recovered from uh, an archaeological excavation in the city downtown near the river in the 1970s had been boxed and stored away and, and more or less forgotten about within uh, VCU's warehouse there until 2015. But new moment that we're in after 1990, there was uh, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which was passed by the United States Congress in 1990. And this created a mechanism and some momentum for trying to return to repatriate these remains to uh, descendant tribes. And so in 2000, uh, the year 2000, those collections of indigenous remains that had been uh, in storage at the Valentine were turned back over to the Monacan tribe where they were respectfully reinterred in Amherst County. So here is, is a new moment for uh, a possible new visibility and treatment and uh, respect for remains that had been fairly hidden away before now. Uh, moving on to the official first burial ground for the city of Richmond upon the city's founding in the 1730s is St. John's Churchyard, which you can see here from an early painting from the 1830s. Um, this was founded on land uh, in 1741, given by William Byrd to the church vestry on a hill called Indian Town. And so we don't know if it actually displaced the, uh, an Indian village that may have been there or perhaps even indigenous burials as well. But uh, this 1830s painting shows us additions to the 1741 church. That 1741 core appears right here. Uh, that was the old west entrance. And it was oriented due east and west. It was created by the Anglican church establishment that was a, an institution in the colony at the time. This churchyard was set aside for white burials only. So here we get that racial exclusion pattern from the very beginning. Uh, but within the white community, it had a, a variety of types of burials. 
those who we might consider elites all the way down to more common burials. And you can see those graves clustering around that entire yard. And you can even see the river in the background. So this is given the place of priority. It's the highest spot in the city. Uh, the, in 1799, the city enclosed the churchyard with this uh, brick wall that you see in, in the painting here. So it was treated as a, as a sacred site. Um, the earliest marker that survives here is from 1751, and it's for a minister, Robert Rose. And there's other really notable folks buried here, like uh, George Wythe, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Now, if we move forward to today, that St. John's Church was the site, uh, many Richmonders know, of where Patrick Henry in 1775 gave his gave, Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech, and it became something of a tourist attraction. And uh, the congregation that survived, the Episcopal congregation uh, that uh, continued to worship at that site after disestablishment, had trouble keeping up the grounds and taking care of all the visitors there. And so in 1938, the St. John's Church Foundation was formed to try to preserve and care for that site. Um, at the time, in the 1930s, uh, it got the city support. And soon after that, the historic Richmond Foundation and the Association for Preservation of Virginia Antiquities really bent over backwards to try to preserve that district. They created the St. John's Church Historic District, and that had the unfortunate effect of displacing a lot of Black families and uh, businesses that were in some of those surrounding um, streets and neighborhoods. But uh, more recently, the St. John's Church Foundation has done a, a better job of outreach and engagement with the neighborhood, as well as the congregation itself. And here we see the foundation's efforts to preserve and interpret the graveyard. On the left, you see um, the marker from 1751 for Robert Rose, and you see Ray Baird, the costumed interpreter, leading a tour for students in the yard. You see a conservator repairing worn stones. You see uh, a, a scientist here using ground penetrating radar to create an uh, underground map of potential burials below grade. And then we see the uh, very popular annual tradition of Fancy Me Mad in October, the Poe, Edgar Allan Poe theme tours. And this is Eliza Poe being reenacted by an actor there for, for crowds visiting the churchyard. And so we see a very creative approach to uh, bringing visitors to the site and learning more about its history. Um, in contrast, if we go back to that era of the church's founding and the churchyard's founding, uh, those of African descent were buried in a very different type of site at the bottom of, of the hill in the, the base of Shaco Valley along the side of Shaco Creek. And you can see that in this 1809 map, the so-called burial ground for Negroes that was recorded there on that map. And uh, this was a very undesirable site. It was a steep hillside. There was a lot of erosion of that, of those grounds. And on top of that, um, this N stands for the city gallows that was set in the center of those burial grounds. Uh, so associating criminality with, with black, the black population at that time, uh, something that we continue to wrestle with to today. And then M, the powder magazine was located nearby. And uh, the site was so undesirable and had so many negative connotations in terms of its condition and uh, those gallows that uh, protesters among the free black community uh, demanded a new site for burial from the city. Um, I, I should say also that it was down the hillside from the Baptist meeting house that did provide perhaps uh, some important religious connections to some of those burials there. Uh, but by 1810, uh, a free black man named Christopher McPherson really led the charge to protest to city authorities the condition of that site. So by 1816, the city opened up another, uh, a second burial ground for Negroes or African burial ground as we'll call it. And we'll see that in just a minute. But look how quickly with this map on the, on the right, in 1817, a new map made the site of the school and the city jail sits right on top of where we think that so-called burial ground for Negroes sat. So the city immediately repurposed this for other site for other uses, and the destruction of the site continued uh, through the interstate construction, through other industrial uses in Shaco Bottom, um, until. Uh, uh, 
uh, activists struggled to reclaim that site and recognize it for the burial ground that it had served uh, all those years ago. And so there you can see a flyer on the left from 2008. Um, we think if you geo-reference those maps, that that original site sat either directly underneath I-95, perhaps with a little bit of an edge stretching into um, uh, what was then a VCU parking lot. We don't exactly know the bounds, the full boundaries of the site, uh, but it's, it seems quite likely that uh, portions of that VCU parking lot were situated on it. And so uh, protesters like the Defenders for Freedom, Justice and Equality, the NAACP, some VCU faculty and students were successful in, uh, in, in rallying the city as, as well as uh, the state government to provide some money to acquire this parking lot from VCU and then rededicate it uh, to the memory here of what they're gonna call the African burial ground. And you can see it uh, in the distance here beyond the sign today. They took the parking lot away. It's mostly a green field. Here are some interpretive signage was placed on the city's slave trail, the commemorative slave trail, and it's just in the shadow there, the NCV buildings. Um, this took place in 2011. And so now this lies at the heart of a memorial park that has been proposed for this Shaco Bottom that would have really important ties to the domestic slave trade with its slave trading district that took place in Shaco Bottom. And so a memorial park has been proposed to include the African burial ground as part of this um, commemoration of the tragic history of those uh, of that part of our town that has not really been fully recognized. Um, a ballpark proposal came and went 2014, but I find it uh, really inspiring to engage with that site here in the in the evening programs that so many groups have have held there. The uh, defenders hold an annual uh, Gabriel commemoration there. Untold RVA has organized events at the site, uh, including uh, this program for Brother General Gabriel that you see there, a dance program in 2019. Um, the African Ancestral Chamber connects with that site, the Alegba Folklore Society. So here we see a real rebirth uh, in possibilities uh, connected to those of African descent and, and their ancestors here in the city and drawing a wide variety uh, across section of city residents to these kinds of programs. Now the next stage there of cemetery development in the city took place as I said on the north side of town and there you can see something of a cemetery district. You see the so-called Jews cemetery, the new burying ground, and then this graveyard for free people of color and for slaves. In my book I call that the second African burial ground because it took the place of that uh, initial site that we just looked at. Um, the name of that shifts all around. There you can see it on the map titled this way. Initially it was two acres, but those distinctions between free people of color and for slaves uh, eventually uh, did not seem to make much difference on the ground. It was called the burying ground for colored persons or the Shaco Hill burying grounds with the, the colored section uh, or the black section, so to speak. Um, this shocks us today, it's, I'm going to get to why in just a minute, but we think this could be one of the largest and longest serving burial grounds for the enslaved in the nation. It ran from, it was active from 1816 to 1879, growing to perhaps 30 acres or so beyond those initial couple acres and receiving an estimated 22,000 burials. And you can see, I'm gonna come back to these other cemeteries in just a minute, but let's continue with the second African burial ground. You can see a list of interments that took place at that site during the Civil War here in 1862. And on the left, you can see the, the date of the interment, the name, if what a name was known, the age of the interment, the cause of death. And then if the person was enslaved, uh, who their owner was. And, and through that list, we see a real cross section of the city. This is not just a site attended or concerned with by the, uh, the African-American community. Uh, the, the white community is very much aware and connected to this site uh, through these kinds of connections as well. Um, 
So it's a, a really fascinating document. You see the male interments on the left and the female interments on the right. And this is just one of those quarterly interments that survives. After the war, the Civil War that is, the graveyard would be exploded portions of it, dug into, run through with roads and a bridge, and then sold off for use as a dog pound. And then this original core here sold off for use as an automobile station. And so we see the remains of that automobile station there on this corner of Fifth and Hospital Streets today. It was ready to be sold at tax auction by the city out of private hands until uh, one of our attendees here tonight, Lenora McQueen, saw that notice of the tax sale and was able to rally residents in the city to begin to protect it in 2018. Lenora uh, it has been a remarkable force here, part of this rebirth in the community. She's engaged a, a wide section of residents and uh, politicians, city officials, um, historic preservation groups to understand the importance of the site. She has created a complete map of the site for the very first time. She traces her ancestry back to a fourth great grandmother named Kitty Carey, um, who died in 1857 and we believe is buried there in that yard. And she gave us Lenora that is a very powerful statement of her engagement with that site when she first discovered it in 2017 and what she can envision for that site's future. I will say that uh, she and her allies have been successful in terms of placing this site on the master site file of the Virginia Department of Historic Resources and uh, the Richmond City Council and Mayor Stoney have uh, made successful moves to acquire these grounds and make it a feature of the commemorative slave trail. So moving on to Hebrew Cemetery just across the street, this was founded in 1816 as the city's second Jewish burial ground. Um, today, we think it's one of the oldest still active Jewish cemeteries in the South. Jews have been uh, members of Richmond residents since before the American Revolution. They played a really important role in city government, in the business community, in the military. And so Hebrew Cemetery is, is quite an important historic site. We see graves dating back to the 18 teens, um, we see a blend here of what I tell my students, assimilation and distinctiveness. Uh, a lot of the grave markers were cut by local stone carvers. But as you can see here, there's an interesting blend between the Hebrew script and the English script, or a more traditional gravestone style, but maybe with a more unique uh, Jewish symbol on top. And here we see the hands of the Kohanim raised in priestly blessing, a, a particularly uh, Jewish symbol there for those, uh, Mark Emanuel and the other that, that are buried beneath that symbol. Um, the assimilation distinctiveness tension, I think is best expressed in the Confederate soldier section of Hebrew Cemetery. And so here we see the Hebrew Ladies Memorial Association after the Civil War forming, they were worried about, quote, the malicious tongue of slander, ever so ready to assail Israel. And their work here, they said, would provide, there is our reply. They gathered the graves of about 30 Jewish soldiers fighting for the Confederacy, some from as far away as Texas, reinterred them in this soldier section and raised funds for a commemorative fence that was uh, set up around that site in 1868. You can see it's got these stacked rifles, furled flags, laurel wreaths, crossed sabers. Um, it's a, a really remarkable uh, Civil War Confederate memorial in the city that uh, was perhaps one of the earliest, frankly, one of the earliest memorials to the Confederacy that were raised in the city. Congregation Beth Ahaba, still around today, their Hebrew cemetery company continues to still care for these grounds. Um, later Jewish cemeteries in the city uh, would care a little bit less about assimilation gestures that we might see here. And so I don't have time to get into them tonight, but the book goes into the later um, cemeteries founded by Jews, mostly from Eastern Europe and some of the more Orthodox congregations that were associated with them. Okay, moving on to Shaco Hill Cemetery. Uh, 
This is the initially called the new burying ground, explicitly set aside for whites in 1822 laid out. There's Richard Young's map from 1824. Look how different that appears to us from the churchyard. There's not burials scattered all over. These are sold in family plots uh, with almost like a city street design with a principal avenue and then perpendicular avenues, very formal plantings. It attracted the rising elite of the city, the, the merchants, the ministers, the lawyers, the doctors, the soldiers, the factory owners. Um, and so this was this different model from that earlier model of the churchyard, uh, but still reinforcing very uh, strenuously those racial boundaries. Eventually it would grow to about 12 acres and you can see its expansion there across from the almshouse in 1876. Well, the city has always owned Shaco Hill Cemetery, uh, but it had run into some problems of upkeep after it filled up uh, in the turn of the 20th century. The interstates nearby and the concentrated poverty at Gilpin Court uh, made upkeep there and visitation there uh, a, a challenge. The Friends of Shaco Hill Cemetery formed in 2007, and there in the upper right, we see Jeffrey Burden and Clayton Shepard, um, officers there, the Friends, who pressure the city or worked alongside the city to do some really creative things. They raised funds to put up new markers for unmarked graves there. They led tours. Uh, they hosted work days. They hosted ancestor uh, appreciation days. Um, and, and so they've really reactivated that site in, in a pretty exciting way. Uh, so uh, we, we see that even for city owned properties that are still in reasonable shape and have really notable burials like Elizabeth Van Loo that you see there on the upper left and John Marshall and his family and another portion of these grounds, they have needed extra effort on the part of volunteers. Across the valley, just to the north, on what was called Academy Hill, we see a similar effort by a, a friends group taking place at nearly the same time. Um, the Barton Heights cemeteries, as we call them today, they were started in 1815 by the Burying Ground Society of the Free People of Color of the city of Richmond. Uh, those free people of color seized their own destiny, pooled their own resources, and created what uh, would be called the Phoenix Burying Ground and it would later be retitled the Cedarwood Cemetery. And over the 1800s, a number of other independent organizations would join alongside aside them, forming a city of the dead for black residents in the city uh, in the late 1800s. Union mechanics, Ebenezer, Methodist, the sons and daughters of Ham, Sycamore. So by the late 1800s, this has grown to over 12 acres, but this was also the time of streetcar suburbs by the late 1800s. And so these new white residents who are surrounding this new neighborhood of Barton Heights uh, did not take kindly to the black activity in these burial grounds in their backyard. So they succeeded in closing further burials there. And by the 1930s, the city took over ownership of these historic black burying grounds. They fell fallow, they weren't very well taken care of by the city, but Denise Lester, who you see there in the center, she moved to town in the late 1990s from upstate New York. She traced a, uh, an ancestor to burial there, um, a freedman buried there after the Civil War. And she really lit a fire under the city and, and took uh, preservation matters, we could speak, in her own hands. She raised historic signage. She did new historic research. She got it listed on the National Register for Historic Places. She put up a new fence. And most excitingly, I think she created these annual Whit Monday celebrations that brought visitors back to the grounds to learn more about their histories. And while Denise Lester, she's still around today. She's still a great friend, uh, but she was unable to continue her work there in the same way. So the site has gotten a little bit more quiet but her legacy there still stands. And we see in the bottom right, um, students that we're able to bring out and show them the grounds where we're trying to build a, a comprehensive map of the markers that remain there. So the third shift that I had mentioned uh, spreading out to the edges of the city after that came with this rural cemetery movement in the 1840s and 1850s. Here we see Hollywood Cemetery on the left and Oakwood Cemetery on the right. 
Um, Hollywood founded in 1847, Oakwood in 1854. Hollywood was owned by a private company. Oakwood was owned by the city. But you can see that the designs of them present a new model, a very curvilinear designed into the hillsides, into the topography, intended to create a picturesque effect for the visitors and, and uh, populations that would engage there. Still, it's a new model, but those racial divisions are still enforced. Hollywood was designated for whites only. Oakwood Cemetery had uh, red sections for black burials, but uh, they were not formally laid out and they were very uh, undesirable locations close to Stony Run Creek in the lowlands there. And so since then, after they were formed, just you know, a few years after their formation, the Civil War broke out. And so Confederate burials came to provide a very important component of these cemeteries identity. From the first soldier killed in action there, Henry Wyatt buried in Hollywood Cemetery, the 11,000 or so Confederate soldiers buried in Hollywood during the war, um, Oakwood had 16,000 Confederate soldiers buried, buried there during the war. That's 10% of all Confederate soldiers who died during the war. So this is, these are major sites for uh, Confederate burials, uh, as we well know. This pyramid goes up in 1869. Uh, after the war, the Ladies Memorial Associations took uh, charge of Memorial Day celebrations there and fundraising. And on the right, we see the, the Davis family plot in Hollywood Cemetery. Uh, so we see very firm connections with uh, the lost cause. Today, um, the Hollywood Cemetery has built up a really enviable financial base for its operations. They're aided by the Friends of Hollywood Cemetery that also do some really creative things. Here we see Kelly Jones Wilbanks, the president of the, or, uh, or the executive director of the Friends of Hollywood Cemetery. Uh, at one of their annual summer picnics where they have bands in the lawn, they have a food truck and an ice cream truck. They've been able to raise millions of dollars for conservation projects, uh, such as uh, the restoration of the James Monroe tomb there, uh, President Circle hired a full-time conservator there, William Oakes, former student of mine, uh, who, who was able to conserve hundreds of uh, markers throughout the cemetery. They have lectures, so uh, some really, exciting, uh, probably nationally uh, significant conservation that takes place at Hollywood. Oakwood does not have the same financial, excuse me, uh, resources. The city provides what it can for its upkeep, uh, but also the state provides some funding for the upkeep of Confederate graves there. And you can see the rough condition of Confederate graves. There was a ladies memorial association that took that section in, in hand and created a, a, a more groomed version of that, raised a monument for it. And so here is some of the contemporary cont uh, commemorative activities that take place, say at Oakwood Cemetery, uh, here captured by Brian Almer in 2017. I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time, I'm gonna move a little bit forward. There's some other elements of Oakwood Cemetery we could talk about if you wanna return to them. But I'm closing in on my last few examples here. Richmond National Cemetery, yet another new type of cemetery for the Richmond region, initially had a fairly innovative approach to race relations. This cemetery disinterred Union burials from around the region, whether it was in a prisoner of war camp like Belle Isle, or on battlefields nearby and reinterred up to 6,000 or more soldiers here in this common burial ground. These national cemeteries were a brand new movement and responsibility by the federal government. Richmond National Cemetery was actually located just inside the Confederate earthworks within two miles of the Confederate capital, right? Imagine the symbolic importance of this. Confederate burials were excluded from these national cemeteries. They were designated for the Union uh, dead alone. And they buried black and white Union soldiers side by side, at least here in, in Richmond National Cemetery, which was, as I say, a real uh, new example of that. You can see the design of it. It's basically a square with a flagpole at the center with a picket fence around the outside. There was a superintendent's house built near the entrance. 
And uh, there was a lot of Decoration Day and Memorial Day activities there that drew large portions of the African-American community, as well as Union veterans as well. National visitors came down. Uh, there was pieces published about this in national publications. So it, 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 there was a lot of discussion locally and uh, afar about the place of national cemeteries in the region. I should have said that there were four others national cemeteries nearby also, Seven Pines, Cold Harbor, Fort Harrison, Glendale, as well as a couple outside of Petersburg. Uh, but here we are back at Richmond National Cemetery showing some of the new life and the creativity that residents have brought to the site. Um, in 2007, there was a Wreaths Across America event held at Richmond National that still goes on today. It's a very popular a way to honor veterans of all wars that uh, grew to populate that site uh, in the 20th century. And here's Joanne Meeker, who moved to the city uh, not that long ago, traced a, a, an ancestor to burial there. And she wrote a whole book on stories behind these stones and would lead regular tours of Richmond National Cemetery. And here you see her giving ready to give those tours and give speeches. And so while the, the War Department or the Department of Veteran Affairs have pretty much kept the condition of Richmond National Cemetery in good shape, there's been a lot of this kind of engagement from the community to help enliven the site and um, provide more on its history. Now, my last section of examples, I call in the book, Post-Emancipation Uplift Cemeteries, founded by and for the Black community. And here we get a map showing Oakwood Cemetery that we've met. And these lowlands are some of these African-American grave sites along Stony Run Creek on the eastern edges of Oakwood. But here across Stony Run Creek, Evergreen Cemetery was founded in 1891. Um, East End Memorial Burial Association was founded in 1897. There was real urgency to create these because as we've seen before, those Barton Heights cemeteries were being shut down by those white uh, homeowners that were surrounding them. So the, the black residents needed new black burial grounds of dignity that they could control because the, the city was not providing them in other ways. And so these show formal designs. You can see my little uh, image of the design of Evergreen Cemetery there. You can see it up the hillside. And then you can see Maggie Walker giving us some sense of uh, how well cared for and well attended those cemeteries were upon their creation. Um, they drew plenty of notables to be buried there as well as just everyday uh, working populations among the black community. But after the 1930s, after the, after the World War II, excuse me, Evergreen and Easton cemeteries would suffer financial mismanagement, extensive vandalism and dumping. They did not receive public funds the way that a lot of the other cemeteries were receiving public funds. Cemetery desegregation in 1968 gave black families other alternatives. And so conditions at Evergreen and Easton um, really started to decline during these years. You can see uh, behind Maggie, the Walker family cross here, in 1964, just how overgrown those sections had become, even in the face of attempts to commemorate her site and continue engagement with that site. Uh, those efforts to try to push back against the overgrowth, against the vandalism and the dumping that took place there, got a real boost with the establishment of the Maggie Walker National Historic Site in the early 1980s run by the Park Service, the National Park Service today. And so park rangers, uh, there you can see in 1980, and you can see Jim Bell here with a, a, a descendant of Maggie Walker laying a wreath at her grave site, um, continuing to try to call attention to those uh, conditions and to try to do something about that with the descended families. And so if this picture here from 1997, not that long ago, still shows us how overgrown those sites were, it was not, you know, 10 years or so after that, that I began taking students out there. And uh, what I saw over the course of these next few years really renewed my faith in Richmond and the possibilities of this city. I saw newcomers and students of all backgrounds 
working alongside generations of descendants, making new connections and reclaiming acres upon acres of history. Volunteers like the, the Friends of East End Cemetery removed truckloads of trash, cleared dozens of acres, produced a comprehensive map, recorded oral histories of the descendants, literally transformed these sites that uh, were very difficult to navigate um, for families up until that, and visitors up until that point. And so we see Veronica Davis, an early champion and uh, prime mover of the, those volunteer activities early on, standing next to John Shuck, another volunteer leader there. We see descendant families returning uh, in greater and greater numbers and engaging with the volunteers. We see VCU students and other students uh, from around the area, Virginia Union, uh, University of Richmond, high school students showing up in huge numbers to try to uh, engage with the site. We see Dolores McQuinn and, and other luminaries and political figures lending their weight behind the effort. Um, after 2017, the Enrichment Foundation has acquired Evergreen Cemetery and then by 2019 East End Cemetery uh, with aid from the state. And I'm really hoping that Enrichment can get this right. Uh, they've displaced some of those longtime volunteers. And frankly, they've set up some barriers to, to my, to our continued work there. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping we can find a way forward with them. Enrichment recently released a master plan for Evergreen Cemetery that's estimated to cost $18 million. So there's, there's big plans on the table and some important changes just within the last few years of those sites. But let me end, this is my last substantive slide here with Woodland Cemetery, an equally important uh, African-American burial ground in town that had suffered some of the same challenges faced by Evergreen and East End. This was created in 1917 by the fighting editor, John Mitchell Jr. And we see here a Marvin Harris, who had been working over there at Evergreen for a while before turning his attention to Woodland. Marvin is a graduate of Maggie Walker High School. Um, he really uh, had a vision for what could happen at Woodland Cemetery. He joined a, a diverse group of volunteers that were already there trying to push back uh, against the overgrowth and the dumping that took place there. Recall that Woodland is also the, the burying site for the famed Richmond preacher, John Jasper, as well as the international hero, Arthur Ashe, who was buried there alongside of his mother. Uh, and so in 2019, Marvin Harris, Kathleen Harrell, others um, worked alongside descendants in Henrico County. They were able to raise funds to purchase this from the private owner uh, for the Woodland Restoration Foundation. And as longtime volunteer Benjamin Ross has observed, it is now a gem of a beauty with a revived spirit of excitement. And so I'll leave you with this slide. We'll open it up for questions. We've got a, a cast of folks across the city working to build a new sort of community through these burial grounds. Richmond doesn't have a unified preservation movement or a plan and challenges do remain. But I'm hopeful that we're in a better position here to appreciate the promise of these efforts, especially from the grassroots. And so I'd ask us, is this our moment of rebirth? Is this where we learn the value of all of our community members through their graves? Is this where we work across previously hardened lines to recognize all of our shared history here? And so I hope uh, my book uh, offers further momentum towards these ends. So thanks for coming, everyone. That's my whirlwind tour through at least a dozen sites. Uh, hopefully, you, it, it may have piqued your interest to ask a few questions, and we could dig a little bit deeper or cover some other grounds that maybe I didn't uh, get into tonight. Uh, and let me make one final plug, if I will, before we take up the questions. Uh, the book is available locally at Chop Suey Books in Carytown, among others. It's uh, expected to be in stock there any day now. And of course, it's available online. I'd be happy to, uh, to sign a copy for you at Chop Suey Books if that's interesting. I've also got that www.richmondcemeteries.org website that features a lot of the same information as well. And of course, that's free. And the Richmond Public Library was kind enough to buy a copy for your patrons so you can check it out from the library as well. 
So Alex, what do we want to talk about now? All right, um, everyone, feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A feature. We've got a few here already. Um, the first one is, is it known where the dead of Chimborazo Hospital would likely have been interred? Chimborazo Hospital was one of the largest hospitals in the nation, if not the world, uh, when it was set up you know, in 1861 or 62, operating through the war, taking care of Confederate patients through the end of that war. Um, there was a, a lot of death. As we know, most soldiers died of disease, or, and there wasn't a lot of other great options for treatment of wounds. And so Oakwood Cemetery, as, as we've heard here tonight, filled up very quickly during the war. Oakwood Cemetery, since it's near to Chimborazo Hospital on Chimborazo Hill on the East End, that received most of the Confederate dead from Chimborazo Hospital. Um, I would venture to guess uh, that 80 or 90 percent of the dead coming out of Chimborazo Hospital during the war were buried at Oakwood Cemetery. Phoebe Pember, who was a, a matron, a, a nurse, so to speak, there at the hospital, does describe giving a, a burial to a prominent uh, officer in Hollywood Cemetery after he died at Chimborazo Hospital. Um, but, but I think Oakwood Cemetery was, was the site of most of those burials. I would just add that after the Civil War, uh, in those initial years after the surrender, uh, there was a freed people's camp set up on Chimborazo Hill. And there's evidence that there are African-American burials, presumably still there today, somewhere on Chimborazo Hill near the site of that one-time hospital and that later camp. Um, but to my knowledge, those burials have not been identified yet. So I hope that answers the, the question. Okay, so the next one, um, I've read fascinating accounts of gravestone decorative trends in New England cemeteries, such as the Death's Head, Urn and Willow, etc. Are there any trends unique to Richmond and what archaeological evidence is available for African gravestones in cemeteries that have been reclaimed? Uh, let me ask you to reframe the second part of that question in just a second, Alex, but I'll answer the first part. You, you're right. Um, what got me you know, I mentioned at the start what got me interested in this cemeteries, but one of the pieces of scholarship that got me interested in studying cemeteries was a classic study by James Dietz about uh, what you could learn through the symbols on gravestones in New England uh, burial grounds. And there's a very classic example of death's heads, the skull with wings that he charted, and that was very popular in the early years, and that seemed to give way to cherub heads, uh, a human face with wings or a soul effigy. And then later on, that, that popularity of that symbol started to wane, and then um, the urn and willow motif took its place. And so you could almost chart decade by decade which one was the most popular and which era of the cemetery you're in by uh, the, those, the prevalence of those symbols there. It was a really an incredible study. And so when I looked around here to Virginia's gravestone traditions, um, I noticed a couple things. We do not have very many death heads. We do not have very many soul effigies. Uh, and those that we do have oftentimes were imported from New England. Um, there was not an early gravestone carving tradition in Virginia. Um, there were not those kinds of craftspeople that were active. It was a much more agricultural place. And so they would order grave markers oftentimes from England or from New England. So Petersburg's Blandford Churchyard, which was active in the colonial era, I think has a soul effigy, has a cherub head along the lines that you could find in New England. But St. John's Churchyard does not have a death head. It does have one sole effigy or, or cherub head, and it was for a ship's captain from Connecticut who must have died in town. And presumably his uh, relatives sent down an example from a shop in Connecticut to mark his grave here. Um, St. John's Churchyard does have that urn and willow motif throughout a couple of grave markers there. And some of those also came from New England. 
And what's interesting is that that urn and willow motif proved popular throughout the 1800s. And you'll see examples of that in African American burial grounds here in town. The earliest African American grave marker that I've been able to identify that survives today is at Barton Heights at that original Phoenix burying ground. And it's the grave marker of Philip N.J. Wyth. And there's no symbol at the top of that, but there is another marker in that graveyard that does have a, an urn and willow motif. And so frankly, at St. John's Churchyard and at the Barton Heights and some of the other early uh, cemeteries, rather than carving symbols, the soft stone that the local carvers started to use in the early 1800s around here uh, just didn't seem to lend itself as well as that hard slate did that the gravestones in New England took to. So in other words, in short, there are very different gravestone appearance traditions uh, and patterns that we see in Virginia versus in, in New England and elsewhere. We could probably say more about that. Was the second part of that question about African-American cemeteries, could I say a little bit more about that? What, what was that one? The exact question was, what archaeological evidence is available for African gravestones and cemeteries mm -hmm. that have been reclaimed? So archaeology can tell us a tremendous amount about uh, the lives of people who didn't leave a lot of written records. And we saw perhaps the most phenomenal example of that in New York City uh, in the 1990s with the uncovering of the African burial ground there in Lower Manhattan. There was an extensive study done on those remains. They discovered certain um, grave markers there that survived. Uh, and so over 400 individuals were recovered from the grounds that tell us a ton about African cultural traditions, um, diet, uh, ways of life. But we have a contemporary area burial ground here with the, our so-called African burial ground or the burial ground for Negroes but there's been no archeology span done on that site. To my knowledge, some of the only archeology span that has been done is ironically on St. John's Churchyard, which we already know a pretty good deal about and have a lot of surviving markers for. And so the, the archeological discoveries uh, mostly point towards those European American burials there on St. John's Churchyard. And I could talk more about that, but any archaeology that's been done on um, black grave sites in town has to have been above ground archaeology, looking at the, uh, the patterns of the layout of the grounds or the surviving markers that remain above ground. Okay, so for the next one, um, have any of these cemeteries suffered vandalism? Just a couple well, I wouldn't say a couple months ago, over the summer, right? So I'm losing track of my time. Uh, there was a story, I believe in July, if not early August, uh, you all know how fraught our summer was in terms of the memorial landscape and uh, the protests, the radical changes that took place. There appeared to be something of a backlash against those racial justice movements with some white supremacy uh, spray painted tags uh, that targeted the Barton Heights Cemetery's markers, targeted markers at Evergreen Cemetery, and targeted markers at Sir Moses Montefiore Cemetery, a Jewish cemetery nearby. And so those do appear to be racially motivated. Uh, one of the most uh, the, the horrific episodes of vandalism certainly took place in Evergreen Cemetery in years past and decades past, where bodies were pulled out of a mausoleum and mutilated and set on fire uh, and desecrated in innumerable ways. Uh, there are other examples of this type of desecration taking place uh, at Sir Moses Montefiore in the 1990s where KKK symbols and uh, other um, hateful symbols were, were spray painted across those. So I'll say this, I'll say that cemeteries do tend to attract uh, a certain hoodlum element, people stealing or people breaking in at night and doing things that they shouldn't be doing, really shocking things. Uh, but it is the black cemeteries and the cemeteries of religious minorities, such as those among the Jews that uh, tend to attract an oversized share uh, of these kinds of activities of vandalism. Even into the fall, there's new examples of dumping trash 
right off of the roadside, right on top of historic African American graves at East End Cemetery. So it's it's an ongoing challenge uh, that uh, that we'll have to continue working against. Okay. Um, are there examples of successful cemetery preservation that have worked in other locations across the country that we could model here in Richmond? Yeah, that's, I had to think about that for this book, naturally. You know, how have other places done it? I think that Richmond's, before answering that, I'll say the benefit, as I concluded with, of the Richmond scene is that we have very passionate people popping up at a lot of different sites and, and really digging in, sinking their energies into those sites, but we haven't had a lot of coordination across sites, and that worries me a little bit. And so what some of the other cities have done that shows more coordination, maybe the best example of that is in Boston, Massachusetts. In Boston in the late 1970s, they looked around at their historic burial grounds, and they saw vandalism, they saw stones not being well taken care of, and they saw that these would be important historical source materials and perhaps great tourist sites. And so they put together a public-private partnership to inventory all of their burial grounds, create databases, create formal maps, raised a ton of money for upkeep and had a formal preservation plan in place. And so if you go up and visit Boston's historic cemeteries now, you're going to find uh, uniform signage throughout, they're going to be in great shape, and you're going to enjoy and appreciate your experience uh, visiting them. And so I think Boston was one of the earlier and most successful models of creating a coordinated plan, uh, not just the responsibility of the city government itself, but by other private partners working with the city to make that happen. More recently, the city of Austin, Texas, has shown a, a really progressive plan in thinking about the city's um, black, white, uh, Latino, uh, indigenous burial sites in its area and trying to figure out how it can shepherd resources to care for all of those different sites. And so the city of Austin's cemetery preservation plan is, is inspiring and that only was put together in the last 10 or so years. Um, the last thing I'll say about this, maybe we can take another question is, Richmond tried something along these lines uh, a, a while back, I think in the early 2000s called, uh, it's, it's in the last chapter of my book, I don't have the, the title of it, um, the Historic Cemeteries Commission it, it might have been where the Richmond City Council got it in its uh, idea that maybe they could bring around the table representatives from all of these different cemeteries and think about preservation and think about tourism and think about marketing and Think about genealogy, but for some reason or the other, that fizzled within a year or two. So Richmond was not able to make that happen. Um, so there's goods and bads that come with that. But naturally, I, I'd like to see a lot more coordination. I think there's there's there, there's plenty of energies that could be in, well used at more than just one one of these burial sites. All right. Um, does your book explore the history of Richmond's black funeral homes? Mm -hmm. Um, it does. I, I always ask my students, who was burying the dead uh, before the Civil War? And for the most part, it was the clergy. It was the family members who would prepare the bodies. Or in a Jewish setting, it might be a, you know, a, a Shevra Kaddish, a, 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 an order that was charged with the preparation and the laying out of the body and the prayers that were said over the dead. And so it was religious institutions, it was families, and it was carpenters that would build the, uh, build the coffin, or maybe you'd, you'd hire a, a hearse or a, a cart or something to take the body to the grave. All of that changed after the Civil War. Um, that's when we see the rise of an integrated funeral industry uh, uh, emerge from those carpentry shops. And funeral directors or undertakers started to provide a variety of services. They provided a funeral home where the body could be laid out for viewing uh, during or before the funeral. Embalming was a new practice that gained traction during the Civil War, and so funeral directors started to provide that service. Funeral directors um, provided flowers, sold coffins or caskets, provided transportation, worked with the uh, to set up some of these cemeteries themselves, especially at Evergreen and East End. 
Um, and so it was a segregated industry. It was a really important new industry, but especially for the black community. Um, and so my last chapter in the book that deals with that period after the Civil War does have a lot to say about Alfred D. Price or A.D. Price or R.C. Scott uh, and other really pioneering black funeral directors that did so much for their communities that provided a vision of respect and care that black families could not find at say Oakwood Cemetery, you know, at the hands of, of white authorities there. And those black funeral directors went beyond just dignity and care for the dead. They also provided really important community meeting houses uh, for the a community that didn't have a lot of public resources like that. Um, they, they helped join beneficial organizations, and fraternal orders. Uh, they provided um, transportation for people that didn't have any other source of transportation. So yes, I, I absolutely see uh, Richmond's Black funeral directors as having a special role to play in not only the, the business climate, uh, but naturally the, the history of these cemeteries and, and patterns related to death. Okay, do you know of any family graveyards that still exist in Richmond? Family graveyards. Well, I suppose the kicker there is the question is, are they still active? Here's also a kicker, uh, which I'll confess to you. Outside of Richmond, outside of the cities in Virginia, the overwhelming pattern would be to be buried on family land if the family was wealthy and owned its own land, or if uh, you know, if one was enslaved, be buried on the lands in which they worked. And so for ever since the colonial period, authorities had initially tried to center burials in the churchyards or in these municipally designated burial sites. But overall, Virginia was such a rural agricultural state that those distances made uh, congregating those burials together in an urban setting or around a church really difficult. Um, so Richmond is in Norfolk or Fredericksburg, Charlottesville is a little bit unique in that sense that it has these much larger conglomerations of, of burials, larger cemeteries versus those family um, burying grounds that were common elsewhere. But even so, there were really important family burial grounds in Richmond itself. One among white families is the Adams Carrington a uh, family burying ground that was just a block or two away from St. John's Churchyard. So there they had a very fine churchyard at their disposal, but they decided that no, they'd rather take care of their own dead on their own property a couple blocks away. And so uh, we, we still, that one was eventually moved at the end of the 1800s, but uh, we can still visit family burial grounds today in, city, in the city that do survive. I think of a couple examples uh, one is in Shields, oh, excuse me, at uh, Bird Park, right there near the tennis courts on the other side of the, the tennis courts and the, the water treatment plant up there. Um, there is the Shields family burying, Shields Robinson family burying ground that is walled in, but uh, one of the openings just has a gate that you can look through. You can, you can see the family's uh, burial markers there inside that, that walled enclosure that date from the 19th century. And even within Hollywood Cemetery, Hollywood's grounds had previously been owned by the Harvey family. And if you look closely on one of those main walks as you come in, I believe it's on Westvale up on the top of the hill, there is the Harvey family burial ground that was set within the surrounding Hollywood Cemetery and it's still, still intact. And so every now and again, you'll get reports of the discovery of these family burial grounds when someone excavates a new site for a new development and houses are, 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 are redeveloped in some way or the other. I think uh, one was the Vranian family cemetery in, in the near west end of Henrico County. And so we, we see a lot of these family burial grounds popping up. Um, sometimes the county and the city and the state have done a good job of trying to keep track of, of where these things are, but other times they still surprise us. So there are a number of family burial grounds here, even in the metropolitan Richmond area still. Okay, I think we have time for maybe two more. Um, let's see. 
I've noticed that Hollywood Cemetery is used recreationally, or recreationally as a park for many people. What factors cause this? Just money and good upkeep? <laughs> well, folks of a certain generation can probably respond to the vision of taking a Sunday picnic lunch out to the cemetery with your family and uh, they're having your meal at the gravesite and clearing off that gravesite and talking about family history and maybe having Easter egg hunts at uh, Easter time or playing hide and seek in the graveyards. And so uh, I think that uh, in previous generations, it was much more common to take regular trips out like that and, and use the cemetery for more than just a, a funeral or solitary mourning. Um, but <clears throat> today it is true that uh, we see more than just families visiting their grave sites. You see people unrelated to anyone in the cemetery, dog walking, um, sunbathing, um, drawing or painting or taking photographs, jogging uh, and I have to tell you, my students talk about breaking in with a bottle of wine, or there's, as I said, lots of other less savory activities that take place there. And, and I don't know what it is. Our, we began with, you know, how did you get interested in cemeteries? Are these taboo spaces? Are they, are they scary places? And there's something about that mystique that surrounds them uh, that seems to attract people to want to do something there, to feel like they're getting away with something there. But for the dog walkers and for the picnickers and for the joggers, I think that they're just frankly maintaining the tradition for what those cemeteries were oftentimes founded for. Hollywood Cemetery in particular and Oakwood and, and, and Evergreen were founded as, as places of, of, uh, of reconnecting with nature. Just think about the very word, Hollywood, Evergreen, Oakwood, they were places intended to invite contemplation and invite repeated trips to engage with uh, history and memory and civics and their loved ones. And so if someone happens to be walking their dog or, or jogging through a, a trail there, that's, uh, that seems to be much in the spirit. Well, one last thing on that, I'll contrast that with say the African burial ground, which has struggled to be recognized as an important and sacred site on our landscape as we've seen those centuries of uh, destruction leveled against it. Um, that, that nice green field seems to attract folks that wanna play Frisbee or, or, or walk dogs out there. As we know, green space is something of a premium down in, in Shaco Bottom these days, but um, that, that has been an unwelcome uh, set of activities for that site, which is particularly beleaguered and is, is trying to um, convey its sacred nature to people who may not recognize that. So it's, it can be a touchy issue, but I'm sure if you ask the folks at Hollywood Cemetery, if they're used to the dog walkers, that they, that they don't have a problem with it and they're excited to see more people visit, visit the site in whatever capacity, as long as they're respectful in some way. All right, I think one more, and I'm very sorry if I don't get your question. There are so many good ones here. Um, what types of innovative and progressive policies would you recommend to state or local policymakers in helping to preserve and reimagine cemeteries? Mm, great question. So if I'm in class, I would ask all of you that. Um, it seems like we have a lot of engaged folks here. You know, what, what would you like to see happen in Richmond? What, what policies could you imagine being put in place? The couple of thoughts, we just had the Richmond Master Plan, the Richmond 300 Master Plan uh, approved by city council and a lot of work went into that. And my hat's off to the planning office for trying to engage the public on it. But in my reading of that plan, it didn't have a lot to say about the cemeteries. And uh, in particular, the city owned cemeteries, which are really important, like. Oakwood Cemetery, Shaco Hill Cemetery, Riverview, Maury, and Mount Olivet. The budget for the city's upkeep of its cemeteries is, is pretty low. Uh, as far as I understand it, they're what's called uh, an enterprise fund, meaning that they can only, their budget depends on the revenue that they as a unit bring in by selling funeral plots, by selling burial plots. And so it seems like that would pit an open ongoing burial site like Riverview uh, 
against a closed site like the Barton Heights or Shaco Hill Cemetery that really aren't taking in new burials. So if we really want to preserve and call attention to those sites, the, the cemetery office here in the city of Richmond needs to have funds to do that, needs to have a reason to do that rather than uh, having to take money away from its own revenue stream to attract more and more burials, uh, to recognize the importance structurally of these historic burial grounds that are in its care. So that would seem to be a good start for me. Uh, I think one of the, on the flip side of that, one thing that we could praise is that the state recently uh, through the sponsorship of Dolores McQuinn was able to unanimously pass uh, a couple of house bills that would provide a certain level of funding for African-American graves, historic African-American graves for those who lived in the 1800s as a way to recognize the, the debt and the, that the state owes uh, for people who may have been born enslaved and whose burial places had been targeted by all these factors that we looked at tonight. And so I applaud the state's uh, willingness to rethink how it funds cemeteries to not just fund Confederate graves, but to also fund the graves of uh, groups that previously had not uh, received the recognition of the state in that way. So I think that's a really great development. I would add on to that, that we should watch where that money goes. Is it going towards the conservation and upkeep of these really important sites? Uh, which entities have access to those funds? What kinds of reports are they providing on their use of those funds? You know, there has to be some kind of oversight to make sure that that really great uh, legislation uh, is fulfilling the purpose that it was intended to fulfill. All right. Well, I think we can probably wrap it up there. Um, thank you, Dr. Smith, and thank you Can all. I... Uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention uh, that Richmond City Council, I mentioned before, just did pass an ordinance to acquire the historic core of the Shaco Hill African Burial Ground or the second African Burial Ground. So there's another example of policy that we see very recently uh, that will provide a positive way to recognize that site. And so anybody that wants to help can thank their city council person, can thank the, the mayor's office and push towards seeing the, the further protection of that site and the further commemoration of that site. But uh, I interrupted Alex, your, your concluing thoughts here. I no, no, that was that, great. <laughs> uh, that site right now is, is, is still under threat and uh, there's some good things happening there. And I'd love to keep that on uh, this engaged crowd's radar as well. Um, just some last notes. If you're interested in reading Death and Rebirth in a Southern City, um, you can of course go purchase a copy at Chop Suey. Uh, we also have a few copies uh, available for checkout at the library. Um, and thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you all for coming. If you all enjoyed this, please take a look at our calendar. We have many great author talks coming up this month. Um, and just one last thing, I will be sending around a survey and I would love to hear your feedback about this event. Um, other than that, take care and have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for Thank the comments you. and questions. <laughs>